Hello, and welcome to this Tech Blast episode of the series delivering 15 minute overviews of an issue in the lab and the solutions available to help you through it. I'm Tristan Free, Senior Editor for Biotechniques and the host of today's podcast. In this episode, supported by Sino Biological, we'll be discussing the role of organoids in drug discovery. Our guest today is Ritwika Biswas, Product Scientist for Sino Biological. Ritwika, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, it's great to be here. So earlier in the series, you spoke with my colleague Annie and gave an overview of organoids. Could you now provide an overview of the of the drug discovery and development process before we get into how organoids can impact this space? Absolutely. Um, so there are five critical steps in the U.S. FDA drug development process, including many phases and stages within each of them. So step number one is discovery and development. Step number two is preclinical research. Step number three is clinical development. Step number four is FDA review. And step number five, the last step, is FDA post-market safety monitoring. So to put it simply, the process of drug development starts with target-based or cell-based assays, followed by lead optimization, screening, and preclinical approaches. Finally, a target is identified and a molecule is designed for it. Then the molecule goes through clinical research and to clinical trials in humans. And the last steps of the pipeline include registration and manufacture of the medicine. Now, historically, drug discovery, design, and development mostly started with identifying active ingredients from traditional medicines. Later, Classical pharmacology was used to investigate potential drug candidate libraries, including small molecules, natural products, or even like plant plant extracts, and identified those with therapeutic effects. Now, since human DNA was sequenced, reverse pharmacology has found remedies to like existing diseases through modern testing. And this was actually a pretty big step in modern medicine. Now, some of the most tedious parts of this process are basically the target and drug screening. Because according to NIH, for every drug that gains FDA approval, more than a thousand were developed and failed before they even reached humans. And what are some of the traditional methods that are used for target validation um, and drug screening? Okay, so for drug discovery, two different complementary approaches can be applied. The first one is known as phenotypic drug discovery, which is classical pharmacology. And uh, this has been basically the historical basis of drug discovery. And the second is reverse pharmacology, also called target-based drug discovery. In more recent times, Drug discovery has included more definitive lab progression steps, like identifying and validating a target, generating assays to find lead compounds, and optimizing lead compounds to increase affinity and efficacy, and also to reduce uh, potential side effects. Now, a drug target has a specific implication for a disease, and lead compounds are molecules that bind to the validated drug targets. A good drug target should be safe, and it should meet all the clinical and commercial requirements. Once a lead compound is found, the preclinical phase of drug development begins using 2D culture and animal models to determine the efficacy and safety of the drug. Now, usually, researchers determine some critical aspects about the drug. Like for example, um, absorption, metabolization, potential benefits and mechanism of action, then also best dosage and administration route, uh, side effects, interaction with other treatments, effectiveness compared to other, other similar drugs, and also very importantly, effects on gender, race, and ethnicity groups. So generally, 2D culture and animal models are the traditional methods for target and drug screening. Animal models tend to be expensive, whereas assays using cultured cells have proven to be 
easily replicable, quick, and cost-effective. The most commonly used method in drug discovery to date is the use of 2D cell culture. And the 2D cell cultures have aided in the discovery of many biological and disease processes, but are unable to mimic the complicated microenvironment of cells experience in tissues. What are some of the other additional challenges that are associated with these approaches? Okay, so like traditionally, cell culture models have been inadequate in recapitulating the the complex in vivo microenvironment and thus have been uh, limited in their ability to predict in vivo efficacy and toxicity. While no model is perfect, in vivo animal, animal studies do not translate very well to results obtained in human clinical trials, particularly with regard to toxicology. The most common challenges are, first, levels of complexity. So 2D culture systems are too simple and lack complexity. However, animal models can be too complex to identify and isolate targets for specific diseases. Second, levels of heterogeneity. For example, 2D cultures are um, of more homogeneous uh, configurations, whereas animal models can be too heterogeneous because of species differences. Third, high throughput screening that uses robotics, data processing, liquid handling devices, and sensitive detectors to rapidly conduct millions of pharmacological, chemical, and genetic tests. Um, And that can be only applied at either the 2D level, but not at the animal model system levels. Um, Okay, so so how can organoids be used then to address some of these challenges? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, To address these challenges, researchers have begun to adopt more advanced 3D cell culture models, example, organoids, spheroids, etc., um, which better mimic not only the in vivo microenvironment, but also gene expression and functional characteristics of tissues in vivo. Since human cell lines and primary cells can be utilized in these constructs, they provide a method for improving in vitro studies used in drug discovery and development. So 3D cultures lie somewhere between 2D and animal model systems for most studies. Um, But 3D cultures complement the studies in animal models and sometimes they even replace them. And these 3D cultures can be generated from adult stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. So basically we can take patient samples, isolate the stem cells and culture them as organoids. We can use these these systems for disease modeling and perform cell-based assays on these organoids, and then we can select the targets and design the drug accordingly. 3D cell culturing methods are basically beginning to outperform old uh, old 2D cell culture methods, despite the fact that 3D cell culture is still in its infancy stages. Furthermore, each 3D culturing method comes with a unique set of advantages that can be implemented depending on the desired experiment. And a great advantage of the uh, 3D cell culture system is the ease of manipulation that comes with the 2D cell culture system, but it's very hard to achieve in animal model systems. Also, when screening for millions of drug candidates, human 3D model systems have a particular advantage over animal model systems, because um, high throughput screenings identify active compounds, genes, or antibodies that affect human molecules. And so what are some of the integral components that are needed to establish organoids for drug screening? Okay, so um, there are multiple, but just for the sake of time, I'll just name one, which is the growth factor. And I think that growth factors are an essential component of organoid media as these direct the differentiation of stem cells um, through a serial manipulation of combinations of 
signaling pathways that can generate um, and sustain specific organoid types. So for a majority of organoid types, the growth factor requirements include the requirement for um, wind, R spondent one, or a combination of both. For example, with intestinal stem cells, we need R spondent one and BMP signaling antagonists such as noggin. Now, Sinobiological has developed a panel of recombinant growth factors such as R spondent one, noggin, EGF, FGF, BMP, et cetera, with high bioactivity, high batch-to-batch -batch consistency, and high purity to enable optimal and consistent organoid growth for multiple tissue types. Excellent. Um, and then what are some of the challenges then that are still associated with using organoids in drug discovery? Um, so 3D cell culturing methods stand at the precipice of groundbreaking discovery. And have the potential to unlock the answers researchers have been unable to uncover through the use of 2D cell culture techniques. Now, this great technology comes with uh, quite a few challenges, I'm afraid. And um, uh, just to name a few, um, there's the lack of defined extracellular matrix, slow maturation rate, lack of vascularization, and lack of complexity when compared with animal model systems. But these challenges can be addressed by tissue engineering, using well-defined matrices like hydrogels, increasing the complexity of the organoid models by co-culturing and by the use of organoid on a chip model. Although advantageous in many ways over 2D cultures, 3D culture tends to be more expensive and can be very difficult to replicate um, cell environments, microenvironments, when using certain 3D culture methods. Imaging can also become very difficult when large scaffolds are used because there is a limit when scaling a single 3D format. So the most common way to analyze cellular phenotypes is by using a confocal, you know, or a conventional wide field microscope. Now, fluorescence microscopy is often still challenging in 3D culture systems because um, unlike 2D cell cultures, where there is only a single XY axis, 3D cell cultures must obtain a Z stack by taking a series of XY images at fixed intervals in the vertical direction by automated microscopes. So, uh, so basically, there are some challenges that we need to think about. And uh, still, we are, uh, since we are still talking about the drug screening, um, another aspect of drug screening is the screening in cell-based assays that accurately represent human population. And 3D cultures also come into play there, especially in organoid biobanking. Okay, and so you've mentioned organoid biobanking there. What are these biobanks and, and how can they help address some of the challenges with organoids? Okay, so organoids recapitulate the characteristics of the parent organ. Generally speaking, the original tissue physiology and molecular pathology are preserved in the organoid. So instead of just tissue biobanking, which is basically just preserving the biopsy samples, for a later use, we can generate organoids from these biopsy samples and make organoid biobanks that can be used for drug screening. The main advantage of uh, the organoid biobanking over biopsy samples is that you get an unlimited supply of the patient sample because you can keep on regenerating the organoid and you can keep on resupplying the researchers. Moreover, you can get samples from patients representing multiple disease subtypes, and you can identify drug targets in a specific disease subtype. Also, you can identify a disease subtype by studying the drug responses. Fantastic. Um, and how do you see these organoids um, and their impact in drug discovery sort of impacting across into the precision medicine field? So this new technology has a tremendous impact on precision medicine. 
Ever since we could develop and recapitulate the disease physiology microscopically, an entirely new opportunity for precision medicine opened up. Multiple studies have concluded so far that this model is more accurate than other current in vitro models, which are the 2D models. And it contains the potential to eventually lead to personalized medicine as a result of the utilization of patient-derived cells. Now, PDOs, short for patient-derived organoids, can be generated from diverse patient backgrounds. And we can have the genomic, transcriptomic, epigenomic, and proteomic data. That helps in the evaluation in um, that helps in the evaluation of drug sensitivity. And this also helps towards target validation. Furthermore, a particular drug can be used to define disease subtypes by PDO responses. We can also identify functional biomarkers for precision medicine. And in this case, you can also check PDO responses of multiple drugs and personalize the therapeutic regimen for that particular individual. Well, Rika, it's been great talking to you and hearing more about this exciting technique. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much to all of our listeners as well for uh, tuning in and listening. Thank you for listening and goodbye.